Hi, this is Piero San Giorgio, the author of Survive the Economic Collapse. As you might have uh, guessed and recognized, I'm here today uh, in Malaysia, and behind me is the national monument uh, to celebrate uh, Malaysia's independence, and of course uh, its uh, uh, independent struggle from 1948 to uh, 1960 or so actually looks like uh, a monument which could have been uh, made for the Spanish-American <laughs> war, but uh, it actually was made by an American sculptor. Anyways, uh, I want to take the advantage while I'm uh, here traveling in, uh, in, the, in Malaysia for a conference and to meet some, uh, some people. I actually met some, a, very, a very famous and uh, famed Islamic scholar. I wanted to compare uh, his point of views uh, as a, as a color of Islam towards the collapse compared to my views, which are one of uh, materialistic uh, approach, where my approach to collapse is very much um, based on science, based on logic. So I wanted to compare, and it's very interesting to see what religious people think compared to what people like me think. Anyways, I wanted to give a few words about, uh, about Malaysia, as I do whenever I travel, and uh, especially about the uh, potential of Malaysia in the coming economic collapse. So first, the good news. Malaysia is one of the economies that is, are successful today in the world. Uh, it was one of the Asian tigers, uh, very high growth since the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And despite the uh, 97 financial crisis here in Asia, it, was, it is still a country that is quite successful. About 8%, uh, I'm getting out of the shadow here, about 8% growth, and today probably still 3 to 4% growth, which makes it still in the highest growing countries in, in the economy in the world. Now, as you can see behind the skyline of Kuala Lumpur, where I am now, and of course what's interesting to see is that because of that growth, uh, Malaysia was able to put up the infrastructure that is extremely modern. There is a very, very nice airport, harbors, uh, sky rails in the city, uh, train system. And this is the advantage of, of economies which, which have developed very strongly and very recently. It's not like many places in Europe and especially in the United States where infrastructure is very old and sometimes crumbling. Here it's very modern. So that's an advantage it keeps on for a long time. Other advantages is natural resources. Um, I would say first that comes to mind is wood. Uh, there's still a lot of jungles, a lot of wood, a very nice resource to have long term. Of course, people would say and the economists would say, no, the first resource is oil. And yes, there is 10% uh, of the economy which revolves around uh, oil and um, chemicals that are based on oil. So that is, of course, uh, an important asset, which could be also a liability if, um, let's say, countries who need oil that are nearby or far away decide to take over and control Malaysia for, to take the oil. So one always has to be very careful with the blessing and slash curse that natural resources like oil are. Of course, there are other natural resources, tin, rubber, um, and, and, a, and a few others in the soil here. What we can say also about Malaysia is that it's a melting pot of different population. There are Malays, of course. There are people from Indonesia, from China, uh, from Vietnam, from Thailand, from India. And, of course, expats uh, from Europe, Australia, uh, America. And uh, these communities so today are living fairly well together. Uh, they admit that, uh, the, of course, the, the main religion here is Islam. But uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, of course, are well represented and tolerated very well. So this habit, actually, the only country that uh, I was thinking, the country that I was thinking on when I was visiting the first days here in Kuala Lumpur was that it made me so think a lot about Mauritius, of course, on a bigger scale, on how people are able to work together, how people are willing to, to live happily and peacefully together. Uh, now the economy is doing well, so the question is always how is it going to be when the world economy collapses? Is the economy here able to be both competitive? And uh, in all cases, are the different communities able to um, live peacefully together? This is always an open question. I cannot answer that. I, I don't have any experience living here in, uh, uh, in, in Malaysia. So it is a question that you have to, to look at. The government here uh, seems to have been doing a fairly good job as a semi-state uh, and semi-free economy uh, system, which is typical of Asia. 
and uh, they have these 12-year uh, plans that decide which kind of economy must grow. And I think that for heavy industry and heavy economies such as oil and petrol and chemicals, this could, was successful, and there's no disputing that this was successful. Even in banking, it has a fairly uh, successful sector. How is this going to um, be flexible enough or sustainable enough in, in, in a serious economic crisis? Difficult to say as well. Um, the, my feeling from the first only few days here in Malaysia is that people are fairly peaceful-minded. They are not aggressive. They are very kind. It's not chaotic like some other countries that I've visited, um, perhaps in the region or under the same latitude. So clearly, if, that is, if my impression is correct, uh, that's an asset, that people might work together instead of killing each other when things go bad. And, um, and so it is um, an interesting country with lots of ag agriculture, fishing, um, and of course the Strait of Malacca, which uh, has today a significant portion of world's shipping, especially oil, from the Middle East to Asia, and of course goods from Asia, especially China and, and Japan, to uh, Middle East and Europe. So that's strategic uh, choke point, a strategic channel. Uh, is going to be perhaps fought over in the future by major powers who want to control uh, the flow of goods and materials. So that is also something to be, uh, uh, to be careful about. For sure, it is a country that um, has a lot of assets, as many countries in this kind of uh, weather patterns, with lots of water, lots of heat, very good agriculture, uh, tropical agriculture. Uh, that is a big advantage. Of course, there's 30 million people living in Malaysia. That's a lot of people. And while Kuala Lumpur doesn't feel like a very large city, um, the question remains, is there enough self-sustainability to enable a big city like Kuala Lumpur and the surrounding cities, as well as the whole of the country? 30 million people, that's a lot of people in a country like, of the size of Malaysia. And of course, I'm not considering the, the, the part of Borneo, which is part of Malaysia, but of course there's less population. And it's mostly jungle and woods and wood, uh, wood forests. So it's difficult to say, difficult to say. And, uh, and if my friends here are listening to me, are from Malaysia, it would be very interesting to put, post some comments on what you think. Of course, if you read my book, it's better, so that you can see the context of my analysis. This is not about uh, how is Malaysia going to be in the next five years. This is how Malaysia is going to survive in the world economic collapse. So it's a, it's a different topic. This is not about prospective of growth. This is about survival. It's much more tougher much more difficult. So anyway, I'll be, I'll be very happy to listen to you, to listen to your, to your ideas. And uh, lastly, I leave you with, uh, again, this picture of this uh, national monument, which is uh, always very interesting, because there's been a guerrilla war here from 1948 to the 60s. And in fact, it was a guerrilla war that uh, is a typical example of uh, counterinsurgency being very successful. I've read many books about this, um, what they used to call the Malaysian uh, emergency, and how the British managed to very, very successfully uh, manage this insurgency and actually, in a sort of way, uh, win it in a peaceful way, uh, much, more, much more efficiently than they did, I don't know, in, uh, like the French in, 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 in uh, Indochina or in Algeria or Americans in Vietnam. And in fact, probably this left uh, the possibility for um, the, an independence that was less bitter and less difficult than indeed the, the examples I've, um, I've, I've, just, I've just mentioned. So with that, in Kuala Lumpur in uh, June, it's quite hot today, June uh, 2014, and um, I, I hope the best for you, I hope the best for Malaysia, and uh, if you want to know more, read my book, Survive the Economic Collapse, and um, I'll see you another time. Take care. Et non, nous ne sommes pas aux États-Unis, ce n'est pas une, euh, une statue en l'honneur des Américains qui ont euh, combattu la guerre euh, américano-espagnole de 1898. Non, non, nous sommes euh, en Malaisie devant le monument national et qui célèbre euh, l'indépendance de, de la Malaisie et qui euh, célèbre effectivement la, 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 la guerre de guérilla qui a été combattu en Malaisie entre 1948, après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, donc après l'occupation japonaise, qui s'est assez bien passé ici d'ailleurs, qui a été plutôt bien accueilli, euh, comme dans, dans pas mal de pays de la région. 
et euh, 1960, pour, juste avant l'indépendance du pays. En fait, ce qu'il faut dire, alors ici, je suis à Kuala Lumpur, donc je voulais saluer euh, tous mes amis français qui habitent en Malaisie, et notamment à Kuala Lumpur. Euh, ils m'ont très, très bien accueilli, c'était très agréable. Euh, et ce qui est intéressant, alors je vais faire très vite, je ne vais pas vous parler de la Malaisie aujourd'hui, j'ai fait une vidéo en anglais il y a juste cinq minutes, mais euh, peut-être pour vous dire qu'il fait chaud aujourd'hui, hein, j'ai bien transpiré, et euh, ce qui est marrant, c'est que pour moi, marcher dans les montagnes suisses, dans les montagnes des Alpes, c'est tout, euh, tout à fait agréable, tout à fait euh, euh, sympathique. Et donc j'imagine les gens qui, font, qui ont participé à des guerres, soit en tant que bah, guerrieros, en tant qu'indépendantistes, ou alors comme euh, soldats de la contre... Euh, contre un, comme on appelle, on dit counter-insurgency en anglais, de la contre-guérilla. Euh, euh, évidemment, ici, c'était plutôt des Britanniques, des Australiens. Eh bien, euh, ils ont dû avoir chaud et c'est très difficile. Alors autant, je suis plutôt habitué par les balades en montagne, J'imagine les balades, entre guillemets, avec des combats en, en, dans la jungle et sous ces latitudes, ça doit être autre chose. Donc chaque fois, on est habitué à son environnement et pas à l'autre. Pourquoi je vous parle de guérilla C'est parce que c'est un sujet que je suis en train d'étudier euh, euh, vraiment en profondeur, parce qu'un de mes prochains livres va traiter de guérilla et, et de reconquête. Une fois que l'on a ces bases autonomes durables et ces groupes de bases autonomes durables, il va falloir imaginer que nous devons nous préparer à la phase suivante. Et tout ça, je vous en parlerai longuement, longuement, au fil, au fil de ces prochaines années, si bien sûr nous avons le temps d'en discuter, parce que ce n'est pas dit. Donc, euh, voilà, je vous laisse de Kuala Lumpur. Et euh, je... Euh, pays très intéressant. Et voilà, et à très bientôt.